Oh, you have a long torso. I do, and long legs. Yeah. Yeah. I, How I, tall are you? I am almost six foot, five eleven. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. But most people meet me and think that I'd be much shorter than I really am. It's really strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's because I'm petite. Is that, yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Our guest today is one of the sweetest drag queens to come out of RuPaul's Drag Race. Her new album, Call My Life, just topped iTunes dance charts (laughs) at number one and is also worldwide at Number 24. Please yes. welcome Blair St. Clair. Oh, hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you here. You have a beautiful smile. Thank you. Thank you. And a I, beautiful spirit. Well, you know what? I think you should go through life having a beautiful spirit. If you don't, then why, why live it? <laughs> <laughs> why, 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 why even try? Uh, well, tell me how the name Blair St. Clair came to be, because that's a name you chose for yourself, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, as most drag queens, you come up with a name. You know, mm-hmm. most most do. They have an alias. And I had a really interesting story with mine. My mom actually helped me come up with my drag persona and drag name is Blair <laughs> St. Clair. Initially, I tried to pick my own, and that was Daphne Duval. Oh, not, my God. Not, 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 many people, uh, not many people know that. Not many people know that okay, I had a, a, diff- a different name, name no. besides uh, Blair St. Clair. Okay. And I was kind of going with my, my real legal name is Drew. It starts with uh-huh. a D. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the idea of Marilyn Monroe. I thought it was iconic and Hollywood with um, the double M. So mm-hmm. I was like, okay, it could be a double D. And it could have a funny play on words of double D and Daphne Duval. Well, it didn't work because everyone thought I was saying Daffy Duck. You know, so like, like Daffy. <laughs> Daffy. Or, and, and it was like Daffy Laffy Taffy. And I was like, okay, this is not going to work. This has got to go. I was like, I have career goals and aspirations. And I want to go places. And Daffy mm-hmm. and Daphne is not going to take me anywhere. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I went back to the drawing board. I Uh I thought of a new name, and uh, I asked my mom, actually. So I I asked her, I was like, Mom, I need a new drag name. And she's like, well, what exactly is a drag name? You know, like, she didn't really know, and I was Mm -hmm. trying to educate her and become more knowledgeable myself. And I told her I really liked the name Blair, which I kind of got from the TV show Gossip Girl, because Blair herself is kind of... um, Cute, witty, sweet, mm-hmm. smart, fierce, sexy, all of those things, and it's short and little. And so we just kind of decided on Blair at the time, and Blair was what it was going to be. And um, funny enough, I was on the treadmill probably a week or two later, and I had, like, three missed calls from my, ma- my mom. And so finally I call her back. I'm like, Mom, what is it? Like, I'm, I'm working out. Like, what's going on? And she told me, she's like, I just passed St. Clair Street downtown. And at this point in time, it was in Indianapolis. And... So I was like, oh, okay, are you okay? Is something going on? And she's like, no, 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 St. Clair, it rhymes with Blair. And I was shocked at the name. I was like, oh, okay, like, I like that. that, that, that that's cool, that's mm-hmm. cool, I like it. Your mom is your drag mom, mm-hmm. too. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, she, she, she I mean, is so like my, she she is like my name, drag right? mom. Yeah, so, so technically, in, in drag mm-hmm. terminology, yes, my, my okay. mom is my drag mom. So <laughs> would you recommend to any drag queen that has the name Daphne to, to, get, to, to get rid of it? I would, I would say if it's working for you, keep, keep working it. But it's most likely not going to work for you unless you want to work for Looney Tunes. Okay. Uh, Daphne <laughs> Doomount. <laughs> That's Mark's drag name. <laughs> so when you were a teenager, your parents cornered you and said, how was school? How are you doing? Are you gay? Yes, yes, yes. It was... I didn't necessarily like, I'm a, I'm have a, I'm a, I'm a, I didn't have a coming out story. I had kind of like a forcing out story, but just very like sweet and um, innocent, but also very nonchalant. My dad was asking me after school one day, you know, how how are school? How are your grades? How are your friends? Do you like boys? And I was kind of gobsmacked because at that point in time, I wasn't sure that... I knew I, I liked boys, but I wasn't sure that I was gay. I sure. didn't really know for sure. And I, I think, you, you know, it's kind of a, as, as gay men, we have this um, coming of age that we f- understand that there is either a label or there's not a label that defines us. And, you know, we can choose to live our lives by, you know, whichever mm-hmm. uh, name or we, we can choose for that. And at that point in time, I wasn't sure if I was, what exactly was going on. But I was shocked when my dad kind of asked me, you know, what was going on, both my parents themselves. And... So for a while, you didn't talk to your mom. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, tell me how you guys kind of, you know, because a lot of kids come from conservative Christian families who don't understand or embrace their gender or sexual identity. Mm-hmm. And um, how did you uh, reconcile your relationship with your mom? And she became one of your strongest advocates. She did, yes. She is probably my biggest rock today. Uh, out of people that have been in my life for a long period of time. And after that coming out and kind of announcing to the world, yes, I like men, I am gay, 
I think, you know. Very attractive men, by the way. <laughs> they, thank you. Um, and I, I think, that, so at that point in time, I wasn't sure what was really going on. Because yeah. my mom and I definitely felt a lot of distance. We definitely felt like we weren't connected. We definitely felt like life was a little strange. Mm-hmm. Even though that's something I always have been something that I am mm. nothing changed besides a few words that were spoken into the air so that's kind of you know weird to think of it that way but I realized and recognized that my mom wasn't upset with me she wasn't frustrated with me she wasn't angry at me but uh, it took me a long time to f- put, spin my head around it and what it was was my mom was upset that her first born son you know her son her her child could and most likely would have a little bit more of a difficult life, more challenges, you know, different things to encounter just because of who I am. Mm. And she was a little upset with the world. She was frustrated. She was angry. She didn't really understand why her child might have some more trials, more tribulations than maybe other children. But how did you patch things up with your mom? That's interesting because I'm not exactly sure there is an answer there. I think we both just kind of recognized that we loved each other, and love is love. And there wasn't any kind of moment, there wasn't any kind of day, there wasn't any kind of thing that was said. It mm-hmm. was just kind of a, a moment of feeling. So, you know, when you're, you're ready to just sure. kind of, like, let someone back in, you just kind of do. And it's just, I think walls were kind of let down, and um, I don't think she was blocking them from me. I think it was from the world, and I think she kind of finally realized that. I imagine that for a lot of people who are listening to this right now, they don't have the best relationships with their families. Mm-hmm. Um, they're struggling, they're hurting. What I always tell people, you've had your entire life to get used to being trans or queer, bi, gay, lesbian. So cut your parents a little bit of slack, yeah. Yeah. even though they may be Trump supporters, Republicans, hardcore Christian conservatives, uh, doing all kinds of things that are harmful and hurtful to you. But at the same time, forgive them mm-hmm. for because for they know what not they do. Sure. Yeah. And you've had all this time and perspective to get used to being you, but they don't have as much that that benefit. Mm-hmm. What can you say to young people out there who are hurting on what you learned from reconciling with your family on what might be helpful to do? I think what I've learned and realized for my life today is that as a millennial and as someone who is young, I want immediate gratification at all times. Okay. But I've learned that time heals all. And it it is a process. Time will eventually be on your side. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of cliche, but just don't give up hope. Don't stop caring. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on what you're passionate about or what you think matters to you or or what is special. If that is creating a closer bond with your parents, make effort. See that there is effort given back to you. And I'm... Focus and celebrate on the positives. Because I know, myself included, I definitely get so hung up and so concentrated on the negative things in life. There are many, many negative things, and uh, researchers say that there is a five-to-one ratio that we could have one positive thing or attribute or you know, comment that could be given to us, and we focus on the five negative before we hear the one positive. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, kind of what I would say is as a goal to everyone is just to kind of put out a few more positives and kind of really hold on to those positives, too, because it will get better. It does get better. And if it doesn't, you know, there will be a time that you get better as a person. And um, time is really the only thing that can manage that. The world got to know you, unfortunately, first, not before Drag Race introduced you, but through the tabloid press. Yes. Uh, who shall not be named. Uh, Voldemort. Oh, why not? They should name me, so why Listen, not? don't name them. Don't give them free publicity. <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, they basically put the fact that you were, uh, I guess, in trouble for a DUI, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And, That's true. And, and created this illusion, I guess, that like Thelma and Louise, you were driving to Alabama. <laughs> LA with the police behind your tail, sirens flaring. Right. And you were trying to get on. Save me, RuPaul. Otherwise, I'm going to the slammer. Mm-hmm. What What really happened? Well, there are two sides to every story, and, you know, mm-hmm. I can only tell mine. And I, in, uh, so we filmed Drag Race and the early fall of 2017, and I got arrested for a DUI, which is true. That's factual. Mm-hmm. You can look it up, mm-hmm. and I will gladly talk about it. You look really good in your uh, arrest photo. I actually had to get out of drag for that photo. Oh, really? So oh, you were, oh, wow. I was, but mainly, ha- um, I was not like wearing a wig or heels, mm-hmm. but I was 
uh, wearing basically everything else. Full face. Yeah, yeah, full face. So they made you wipe off your makeup to, mm-hmm. to have your mug shot. Peel nails off. That oh were my god, how humiliating! Yeah. It, it was very humiliating, but also humbling. You yeah. know, now, now that I can look back on it and sure. le- learn from it. Mm-hmm. At that point in time, of course, I was angry and mad, and I was like, "Why should I have to do this?" So uh, th- that happened in early spring. Sure. Of 2017, and so I was arrested for a DUI. And at this point in time, I recognize that I made a mistake. I broke the law. Uh, there are consequences for breaking the law. I was the first to to admit that. And you know there are problems. And, and then I was going to do whatever I needed to do. You know, take care of whatever business I needed to take care of. And I was going to continue on with my life. You know, just let it not not pass over it, but just mm. accept it and move on. Sure. And. Um, Little did I know that that would actually come back to ha- what I thought then was haunt me. Because then, um, so I came back from Drag Race after filming. There were these mass media stories all over saying that um, I broke probation. I, you know, left and did all these things that I wasn't allowed to do. And um, made a But big- you didn't bre- break, it was perfectly I, I fine with the I, I took care of everything that I had to do with, okay. beforehand with mm-hmm. filming because that's why I was able to do RuPaul's Drag Race. They did okay. an extensive background check mm-hmm. on you. You know, the show was very, very involved with the whole process before. I thought you got arrested for stealing people's hearts. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> that's my joke, but you, I, I mean, you I, can it, use I that. I could probably still go back to jail mm-hmm. for that. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's, a, that's actually a mm-hmm. terrible joke. But, because uh, that's very serious. And so, so at this point in time, you know, like I was going through so much, you know, I was coming back from the show and you know as now viewers know I was eliminated you know throughout the show so like I came back I saw these tablets I saw these things going on I saw people that I trusted with information about you know what what was going on in my my personal life and um, my legal life reposting the story not that they were advocating for the story but reposting and saying oh this isn't true but every time you repost every time you retweet every time you share you're putting that image you're putting that message back out into the world Mm -hmm. and I was like oh my gosh like guys stop this you know you're just you're adding and you're fueling the fire to this stuff that isn't true Mm -hmm. or you're fabricating it what what already is true because there there are pieces that are but everybody loves a rebel and it certainly like made you the talk of the town Mm -hmm. way before the season started we thought you were definitely a bad girl right right (laughs) Most people thought, you know, know. that, that, oh, Blair St. Clair, that girl, she, she, she was so bad. And, and the truth be told, you know, I, I was, I was taking an opportunity that was given to me that I had worked very hard for and sure. did everything in my possible being to take care of that issue. I had learned from that issue. I had struggled from that issue. I mean, financially, you know, with lawyers and legal fees and internally and legally. And mm-hmm. so, like, I had already done a lot of my penance for that, and then I had to go do public penance as well, mm-hmm. with everyone knowing my business, with breaching my my privacy, and, you know, then hearing the hate and the commentary mm-hmm. from everyone else. Mm-hmm. And no one's perfect in life. Mm-hmm. We all make mistakes. Right. That happened to me, my legal mistake. Because not only was it putting your, your, your legal troubles on blast, it was also putting you on blast for being on Drag Race, and when that mm-hmm. was, at that point in time, was a secret. And yeah, you're not so legally silent. allowed to comment on it at all. Absolutely not. Until now. Mm-hmm. So at that point in time, I didn't feel comfortable talking about anything legally that happened to me. And I also didn't, you know, I disappeared for quite a few weeks on end, and I just reappeared, and all these things started talking mm-hmm. about me, so I didn't want to make a public statement and draw more attention to myself. And then I also couldn't say anything about Drag Race. So I, you know, I talked to producers, I talked to uh, people on set, and I said, you know, what can I do? And they said, basically, I'm sorry, but you have to just stomach it. And when time developed and I could talk about it in the spring, I didn't want to. I didn't want to bring more negative mm-hmm. press back to myself. I, at that point in time, I had gotten through it, mm-hmm. gotten over it, it made me stronger, and I just wanted to move forward. What do you say to people who set out to fight with you, to start conflicts, because they feel that empowers them? And mm-hmm. I think, you know, in the mindset of posting, you know, this unnecessary um information about you on social media was really stemming from a place of that they're hurting. Mm-hmm. What, what do you say, what kind of love lay- letter can you write to these haters, to these fighters? You know, today, looking back, and I would not have been able to say this mm-hmm. months ago, mm-hmm. but today, honestly, what I would tell those people is thank you for your hate. And I know that sounds very convoluted. I know that sounds crazy. And I don't uh, I don't advocate any sort of hate whatsoever because, you know, that just, what's the point? Mm-hmm. But um, inevitably, I needed those negative comments, unfortunately, and my face being broadcast 
you know, nationally, worldwide, actually, because it was, mm-hmm. the story was picked up, you know, all over the world. And um, I had to sit with that and know that, you know, people, their first impression of me was going to be of having a bad character. And that was really, really hard for me to mm-hmm. stomach because I was like, I, I, I think I'm myself as a good person. I try to act in the best way I can you know, we all make mistakes as humans, but to put my right foot forward every day. And so that was the most hurtful thing. Mm. And so I would tell someone today, think before you post, because that one moment, that one comment could change someone's life. A- activism is not attack activism. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> That's and, what Damon L. Jacobs and I, said. Yeah. I, I took, and I, I'm thankful for this, that I took the negative hate and yeah. the negative commentary and I turned it into something positive for my life. And I, I looked at that as a, a mass spread of hate and said, okay, cool. Like, you know, there's a lot going on. I was like, it's possible that I do have more of a problem of normal drinking because, you know, obviously, hello, like it's all over the world right now that, you, you know, I, I had problems with drinking in the past. So let me like look into this, you know, look, look, see if there is a problem. And, and, you know, today I I live a sober life because I have realized that that is, um, a problem of mine that I needed to encounter and I needed to look at the reasons and the things behind the alcohol that it was masking that I was using that for. And so inevitably I try to look at it as beautifully as possible and as optimistically as possible. And that like the hate turned me into getting my life together. Now in the vid music video for now or never, um, you sort of pay tribute. I don't know if you're aware of this. To I Love Lucy, yes, uh, with a Vita Mita Vegemin mm-hmm. bottle yeah. that you pull out and get drunk on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was that conscious or? Yeah, that was okay. conscious. There, there are. Yeah. If you watch both of my videos, you know, for now or never, and call my life, mm-hmm. they are both have a lot of symbolism in them. And I ask a lot of my viewers and my audience and my fans. I ask, you know, hey, what did you notice? Did you see anything? Because they're actually very thought out. They're very meticulous. There's a lot of planning that I put into those and behind the vision board of saying, okay, I want this because I want this to represent this kind of person. Not necessarily just me, but I want it to represent this person or alcohol wasn't necessarily just representing alcohol and dumping it out and saying, I'm done with this, but it was that alcohol can contain liquor um, literally or metaphorically, it can h- contain people's problems, their Vitamins, problems, their worries. meat, vegetables, <laughs> mineral, <laughs> and 80% alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> totally that. But, I mean, there's certainly, like, you know, an inspiration from that iconic moment in Lucille Ball's comedy mm-hmm. career that you certainly relate to. Yes, yes. And you both have these, you know, you're both these cute, adorable, <laughs> bright-eyed, bushy-tailed redheads. <laughs> or, I mean, do you see yourself a, right now? I mean, you're obviously not a redhead, but uh, oh, don't tell as, my secrets. As don't a drag see. queen, like, uh, what? How do you see yourself? Like, you know, besides of somebody in recovery, in, are you a, a happy-go-lucky girl? Are you a bad rebel? Are you a comedy queen? Are you a, a activist queen? I see myself as an ingenue. Okay. So that what is, and, an ingenue is just so, somebody who's and, not who's new to the scene. Ingenue right? means you know someone that's kind of new, young, fresh faced, and yeah. I think that kind of represents and embodies me because. They also have a journey. Usually mm-hmm. the ingenue is like the young female lead of the show who has some kind of journey throughout. And, you know, she either finds love or something happens. And so my whole life is my journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like I, I kind of come in really young and cheeky and just kind of here to have fun and enjoy life and to learn along the way. And I'm, I'm learning lessons each day. So I, I'm, I'm finding that journey. You know, I don't know exactly what the end of the story is going to be, but I'm going to f- come full circle and get there. You filmed this uh, on an airplane and, and it's about yeah, to crash. Yeah, yeah. What, who's what airline is this? To make sure I don't fly on it. Jinx Monsoon's one of the stewardesses. This oh is, my god! This, we, we, we call this Blair Saint Air. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, as um, Jinx so lovely noted, we thought it was you know really funny to to kind of play homage to to my name and also. How much that, was that scripted? That scene between you and Jinx Monsoon. That was completely uh, improv. Completely. Oh, just, they just put a camera on us. We kind of talked about it. And we actually, um, Jinx and I hadn't really worked much together before sure. shooting the video, but our chemistry was insane. We just got along so well. Well, she was cracking you up a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Jinx is crazy and for all of the best reasons possible. <laughs> she, she, she was so much, so much fun to do that video with. She wouldn't make a good airline stewardess, though. Because she's drunk. She, she would probably, <laughs> she would probably like shove people into the bathroom on the airplane and like just shut them up. You know, be like she'd probably yell the baby's crying. But is that actual inside an airplane, or are you guys on a film set that looks it, like it, the it, airplane? It was an old airplane that was turned into a film set. So the answer is both. Mm. Oh, but th- th- you were not like at an airport. You were actually in a studio somewhere. We were in a yes. Okay. Yes. Like is a it studio. the studio that's always like an airport? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. yes. So, that's, so, so it, it's, yeah. it's kind of both. We've seen it like in, in different commercials and stuff like that. They have mm-hmm. a studio that's an airport, and then there's a plane that they people get on. <laughs> yeah. Part of, like it's just the studio that uh, anytime people want to do something in an airport or a plane, that's the thing they use. It's out, out it, in it, LA, it's all, right? Yeah. It's yeah. always there. Yeah. You're, you're putting every penny you're making into these expensive music videos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a lot of it. That, that, yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. And your and your boyfriend's like uh, Lucy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like stop spending the milk money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, because you and your boyfriend just moved in together mm-hmm. into a new home in D.C. Yes, Washington D.C. And uh, so talk about like the 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 pressures that's putting on your relationship. It's like you're bringing all this money in. You guys are traveling all over the place. Mm-hmm. And I know for me and my husband, it's like, you know, whenever some of us earn money, it's like it is a tension on how that money will be spent. Yes, yes. And how do, how do you guys negotiate that? Well, we have a couple different things that work well for us that um, the main thing piece being is that first and foremost we look at Blair mm-hmm. as a separate entity from everything and we look at um, we look at my boyfriend. So is your boyfriend like May I speak to Blair now? <laughs> oh, he knows when, when I when I flip. He's like he's like okay. I was like uh, he, the monster. She, she, she is here. She is here. She is ready. She is she's going. She's ready Rupal to make money. Paul describes herself as the monster. Does she really? Yes. Yeah, she says the monster is out. I love. I, I never heard that. She describes her drag alter ego as a monster. Good for her. Good but for her, you, girl. I don't think your drag alter ego is a, a beast. Um, Maybe on this no. runway. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I I wouldn't consider myself a beast in drag. I try to be a little bit. Lighter, I would say maybe out of drag, I'm a little bit more subdued. You're kind of like a Disney character, right? In that so, sense. Somewhat, sure, sure. You know, there's an enamel pin with your face on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The How many enamel smile. pins do uh, do you sell right now that have your face on it? I sell two, and then like a sticker. Yeah. <laughs> Collect them all, kids. Collect it them is, all. It is like going to Disneyland when you go to DragCon. All the kids have all this. Stuff all, all over the their jackets yeah. now. Pins, yeah. yeah. I, I haven't spent a whole lot of money investing in pins, more so in, in some music videos oh, yeah. and into the music itself. So it's recouping. And and so uh, I imagine that, like, um, the experience of, like, performing this music live in front of an audience versus, like, you know, in a studio is very different for you. But you have this Broadway, you know, musical theater training, so this is no big deal for you. It, it, yeah, that it, it's different. It's very different. Mm-hmm. Because training to sing on stage, which is something I'm used to, first and foremost, I've always been taught, um, believe it or not, to try and sing as masculine as possible. And uh, that's not really me. So, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it, I, I've been taught and, and, and pushed it, it's Can for so long. Can you give us an example of what your female voice sounds like? Then? My female voice is just a little bit breathier. It's can just you, a little bit lighter. That? Like, um... Like, um, well, hello there. How are you? You know, Ooh, it's I'm just, getting so it's turned a, on. Is this a little bit softer? You know, is this the voice <laughs> you're like looking for? Do you like this, baby? Do you like it? Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I, I've been. Welcome to Blair St. Clair. Uh, it's a dollar ninety nine for the first five minutes. Your <laughs> fantasies come true. What do you want to do? And ten dollars for s- seven minutes in heaven. If you're lucky. <laughs> you know, it, it's why are all drag queens such whores? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an easy thing to tap. Into. It's, Just, it's, 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 it's a funny, quick laugh. It's, it's kind of cheap. We're fluent in that language. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm fluent in many different ways of speaking. <laughs> many. How did you and your boyfriend uh, come together? You have a prom- Can you show the, ring, the, the promise oh, yeah, ring? Yeah, sure, sure. I wear this promise ring actually at all times. I never take it off. He gave it to me at Christmas. You're a good so Christian girl. I, I am a good committed girl. I'll tell you. And I, 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 um, <laughs> are, are, are you Satanist right now? Or is it practicing? Um, no, no, or? no, no, no. I'm very <laughs> spiritual. I'm very spiritual. But he... So Christmas yeah. time came around, and he he told you know it was a very special gift of mine. Yeah. I wear um, anytime I'm in drag too. Like this is the one thing that actually does not that come off my body. Come off. Never comes off. And you can see it, can in, I see it? in photos. Yeah, you can see it in my photos. You can uh, see it a, in uh, uh, music it's, videos. Wait, it's stuck. It's stuck. It's stuck. <laughs> you can't get it off anyway. It's a beautiful ring. What is it made out of? Uh, it's white gold. Ooh, white gold. Girl, nice. this is expensive, yeah. honey. That's and a Blair thing. I need to polish it up a little bit. She might have some yes. makeup in there. And he has and he has the same ring. Yes, yeah, one very, on very, his, very similar. On mm-hmm. his penis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That, that's for me to know. <laughs> me to know. But that, so, how did, uh, I mean, you guys. It must have been a very emotional mom- moment to give those rings to yes, each other. Yes, yes. Um, Is that something you guys planned out, or were you surprised by it? We, we had kind of talked about it, but it was solidified over Christmas. Mm-hmm. We had said, you know, that... When you know someone, you know someone. We're not ready to get married at this point in time, because especially... Things were going to get crazy in the spring, mm-hmm. as they sure did with the drag race journey. And we knew that marriage wasn't, 
something that we could focus on realistically right at the moment, but we know sure. that that's something that would, we, we are committed to. You know, at one point in time, we were committed to our monogamous relationship of being together for the rest of our lives, and um, it was it's a symbol of that. It's a symbol that I wear every day that reminds me of that, and it, it reminds... Um, I try to keep that piece. It's the one piece of me, that commitment, that love that I share with him in and out of drag. And it's the one piece that really stays. And you meant, how did you guys meet? You know, you know, as I've, I've mentioned in very openly that I am sober and um, uh, we, we met both together, like in a um, in support and, and in recovery. Since. You 13 stepped him. No, definitely <laughs> didn't do that. Because if you if you 13 step someone, you'll definitely. So that's um, a that's be one go a for people in recovery when you when you start dating somebody who's in the same recovery program as you. It, it, it's very similar. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. But but you know, obviously, like you guys uh, share uh, similar struggles, and so birds of a feather flock together and mm-hmm. it's certainly something besides your sexual attraction to each other it was something that really sort of laid a foundation for your relationship yes and I think what solidified it even more was our uh, willingness to work together so well and our friendship that really blossomed and mm. was groomed so well throughout the process of Drag Race you know you have so many we try to look at each other as you know each of us separately and our sure. relationship as a separate entity as well mm-hmm. there's three entities that we really thrive need to thrive to make us work so sometimes if something is said we try to say like if we can't take it hurt personally you know or if something is said in the media you know about one of us or an attack or something we try to let that not be a personal attack and be like okay someone tried to attack the relationship mm-hmm. let's talk about how we can further move past that or whatever you know or whatnot mm-hmm. and um, we try to keep our, our lives very private and very personal sure we, we, we are seen with each other very often we tag mm-hmm. each other in photos we you know, we're a couple I'm 23 years well, old, and I want to date. You know, I, mean, I have my boyfriend. Your boyfriend's sitting in the, uh, inadvertently in the background of this video. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, <bye. laughs> Honey, he's a good-looking man. So mm. are you, too. <laughs> Thank you. you know? I, I'm very, very lucky. I always say when people talk about my husband and you know, being attractive, I said, Honey, I do not fuck ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I do declare I got the right one. <laughs> uh, did, RuPaul came up with that. He I did. Declare. Yes, yes. So the first time yeah. he ever announced my name, which that is a weird phenomenon when you're mm-hmm. dreaming for so long to meet RuPaul, the RuPaul. You know, he's the queen bee of what you do. You grew up watching the show. Yes, I did. I, I am 23, and the show came out 10 years ago. I'm on the 10th season, so right when I was 13, 14 years old. And it was really interesting to, to, to meet him for the first time, but then not only did he say my name for the first time ever, but he also said, I do declare Blair St. Clair, and then he said it again. Like foghorn leghorn. And then, it, yeah, yeah, and it was like, bah, bah, I said, son, 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 da, uh, 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 girl, come over here. I do, <laughs> I do declare Blair St. Clair. <laughs> I, I just, foghorn I, leghorn is based out of a uh, Midwestern politician. Is it really? Yeah. Interesting. Everybody's Midwest. Yeah. And you're, you're from uh, India, but so, I'm sorry, I was just so excited to mm. uh, talk about this stuff with you, but so, your expectation to be on RuPaul's Drag Race, you have dreams, I'm sure, all your life, mm-hmm. and to actually step into the new workroom, which was redesigned this season. Yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah, when I walked in for the first time, I, I forgot that it, it wasn't a room. You know, it's it's, it's four walls with no ceiling because there's lights. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a set. Yeah. And I walked into the workroom thinking it was a room, and I was shocked that it wasn't. <laughs> And, and and so, w- what was your uh, reaction to that? I mean, because you start seeing all the contestants piling in when they come in. That's the first time you ever get to see them. You yes. form an opinion about them. Yes, and they're telling you who they are mm-hmm. by the way they enter. That it, yes, they are, and they're kind of they're giving you a descriptive detail sure. of who what what legacy they might lead on the show. And it is true. If anyone's ever watching or interested or curious, you do not hear anyone, you do not know who is there, and you do not see anyone who is there until you walk into the workroom and then they follow or you follow them. And it, it's crazy because out of the thousands upon thousands of drag queens that may be in America, Mm -hmm. you have a maybe preconceived idea of who might be there. Mm -hmm. And I know I sure did, and I I was... The one person I... Two people that I really knew I thought for sure were going to be there um, were Miss Cracker and Aquaria, and they both happened to be there. Mm -hmm. And I just just knew because for knowing them on the internet... And and, were you like, oh shit, I'm going to (laughs) lose? I walked walked in day one, and I thought, oh shit, what did I sign up for? Mm -hmm. Because I can do this, Mm -hmm. and I'm going to do this, but it's going to be hard. you're quaking in your Mm -hmm. heels. Yes, I I knew it wasn't going to be 
easy, of course, you know, because that, that's definitely not the case. But I didn't... I am I'm a control freak. I like controlling situations, and I knew I couldn't control mm, that sure. situation. Mm. So uh, that, that yeah. was frightening. What was your... Uh, did you form opinions on the girls based on their entrances? Interesting. I, I think that someone... I definitely formed a bit of an opinion on the vixen. Okay. I saw her walk in, uh, you know, saying that she wanted to fight. And About at, four or five times, they're like, can we do that again? <laughs> yeah. she, she, def- she definitely walked in, and she, I think her horns f- fell off or something, she had to come back and re- redo that. <laughs> oh, seriously? That, that, that is serious. Good, that is serious. Oh, my God. She, she, I think she, um, so everyone walked in the workroom once. I think someone she was trying to look twice. tough, though. She, she was trying to intimidate very tough. you guys. She was very tough. However, yeah. she was the first person I did talk to on set, mm-hmm. uh, privately, and she is the was the biggest sweetheart to me. Mm. So I will tell you, you know, first and foremost, she kind of pulled me under her wing, almost kind of like a mother hen. Mm. Was so very, very endearing. When she left the reunion, why didn't she go out after her? <laughs> I was still trying to collect my check. <laughs> I was no, no. I, why did the producers I love, go after I her? I love how who, who, who was the one who was sitting there saying like none of us went out and out and got her. I'm like, well, you're still sitting you're there. Still Get sitting. up. <laughs> no, um, I, I will tell you yeah. uh, off the, I guess on the record that. Um, I did ask if we could follow, if we could mm-hmm. do something, and then uh, we took a mini break, and I said, can we, can we go talk to her? Can we convince her to come back? And um, I was told that, you know, she, she had to be doing her own thing at the time. Mm-hmm. So um, She asked not to be. I, I'm not sure. You I don't, don't, I don't okay. really know. I don't really know. But um, I did seek out asking. But in the moment, you know, I, I know. I didn't follow. Mm-hmm. I didn't. It, it does concern me because this, this ongoing sort of discussion on representation and uh, great gratitude mm-hmm. um, that's happened. It's a, it's a false binary on Drag Race, right? It's either you're on RuPaul's side or you're on the Vixen side. And I think we can right. support people and fight for equality and be grateful and at the same time have a frank discussion on representation. Mm-hmm. I think one of the best parts about representation is not representing one side. I don't think you have to pick a side, pick a label, mm-hmm. pick a name. I don't think you have to necessarily draw a boundary anywhere. I think you can say, this is what I believe, this is what I stand for, this is my opinion, and this is what follows. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a mix of what is right in that situation. And I think it's about just really sticking to your guns and following through and not being, you know, being a leader. I think it's sure. important to be a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, will you be performing in Black Girl Magic with the other girls? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this time around. I don't. I don't but, um, I, I don't. <laughs> it's so, it's so I imagine that like you know all this conflicts unfolding before you, and I and I noticed that you know with Sterling with Cameron or yourself, you guys were like, oh shit! I hope this you know when there are fights unfolding, sometimes. Mm-hmm. The healthy or, or an, an understandable reaction is just to stay out of it. Mm-hmm. And I certainly like sense that from the two of you this season that it was just, you know, and then, then maybe especially Cameron was kind of accused of being standoffish when, honey, that is your fight to have. I'm not, right. you know, I'm right. not getting involved. Well, for me, I think when we were filming the show, so mm-hmm. the episodes that people saw on TV that were filmed months before they actually aired, I definitely was. I tried to withdraw from any kind of conflict. I didn't want the conflict. I didn't want it to be a part of it. But over the course of the show progressing being on television and, you know, me going through my own um, life lessons that, I, you know, I've, I've encountered throughout this process and this journey, I've recognized that, you know, I have a voice and it is important to... Sure. It, it, it's not, you know, I, I, I am important. And, and what I have to say is important. And that doesn't mean that I need to attack someone for what they have to say. That doesn't mean I need to stand up for every instance I can pick my battles, which I have done before. But I am, if I have something to say, I am going to say it today. Well, well somebody think about the butterflies. Those were butchered. <laughs> the butterflies that died needlessly. <laughs> Asia O'Hara is a criminal. No. PETA, PETA. Uh, people for the um, uh, desire for attention. Um, <laughs> Did, because. Did, did P- I didn't hear that. Did PETA issued a statement saying, "How dare you, oh. Asia O'Hara, for killing butterflies?" I do well, know on Asia, you know, defend Asia. I know that she put so much uh, research and effort into making sure that that was supposed to be a nice spectacle, and you know, she kept them in good temperature. She did everything she possibly could for it to her happen. Tits were too but hot. they do say, they do say, you know, I will say this: they do say <laughs> there are two things you don't work with in showbiz, and that are animals and children. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is one of those instances that kind of proves that fact that you don't work with animals, and you can't really truly rehearse mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Right. I, I guess. In Insects do qualify as animals. Of course yeah. they do. Absolutely. Of course they do. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, they're not mammals. You know. yeah, yeah. Like the animal you kingdom. Uh, do we blame Sasha Velour for all this because she had such a spectacular reveal last Absolutely. year? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you top that. <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean, I mean not, not, not spectacular, but like iconic. And it was, it, mm-hmm. 
it's so like I I want to live one day in Sasha Valor's mind mm -hmm. because her mind she is such an intellectual and I respect that because every part if you watch her perform if you've ever seen her perform it's incredible mm -hmm. everything's thought out every movement it's, it has a purpose uh, she actually hands out uh, brochures beforehand with a bibliography of uh, Foucault, <laughs> Susan, Sontag. The footnotes, yeah. Uh, Does so she you can really? read. I'm just joking. <laughs> oh, I, I would, I wouldn't put a pastor, and I would respect that. I, I really would. You know, there's some other people I might be like, okay, girl, like, like, mm -hmm. and, no, that that's incredible. I, I, I'm impressed. I was like Foucault, Su Susan Sontag, John Berger. Look at you. Look it up, girl. <laughs> Academic <laughs> queen, real nasty. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Are, are you double jointed? By the way, people are asking me double to ask jointed? you that. I can do that. Is that double no, jointed? No, you were doing some crazy this? shit with your fingers, bending them right. backwards. Like this? Yeah. Oh, that's, Jesus, don't do th that. Is that weird? That's yeah, not, that's, that's kind of fucked weird, up. I can do this thing, too. Like, the, everyone did in elementary school. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's pretty normal. Like, people mm -hmm. Can that. you stick your foot in your mouth? Yes, I can put my feet behind my, my neck, what? too. Oh, wow. I can do that. Can you, you do that right now? On here? Not in the shorts. No, I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be more. It'll be a different kind of show because everything's about to rip apart. <laughs> what was the biggest surprise to you about being on Drag Race? Oh gosh, the biggest surprise. Well, everything. Everything was absolutely a surprise. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I think my relationship with the other girls. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it was. It, it, oh, it's always evolving. Mm -hmm. Because on the show. You want to win something, and you're in a competition with drag queens. And so I like to say that RuPaul's Drag Race is the most similar to Survivor, because it's survival of the fittest of other men in dresses. Mm -hmm. And that is the most terrifying thing you could ever sign yourself up for, because if you want to subject yourself to that, uh, I don't want to be you, and mm -hmm. I certainly didn't want to be me at that point in time. And, uh, I, I, yeah, so walking into Drag Race, I thought I was going to be best friends with everybody. Uh, that wasn't the case, because everybody wanted the same goal that I wanted. And after Drag Race came out, we were all in this weird anticipation moment of, oh, this is going to come out. How am I going to look on camera? And it was, it was weird. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my career could be on stake of how much I, of I am on TV or how little I am on TV. And then you, be, you bond as well, too, like mm -hmm. over each Elimination Week. So I gained mm -hmm. friends. I went through the emotions of, like, Gaining more friendships, it, it was uh, that that was really that is not what I expected. I didn't think that I would be as close to some of the people on the show that I am. Mm -hmm. Who did you get close to? Miss Cracker and I are very close. She's and, lovely, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. Yeah. She is just as zany, wacky, and crazy as you see on TV mm -hmm. in real life. Every day, I believe just it. less makeup. We had her on the podcast before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> crazy. As she a has cracker. opinions. Mm -mm. She's got opinions. She does, mm -hmm. and, and I respect that. I respect yeah, people with opinions. I, I, so she's your she's your go to good Judy. She's to my good Judy gal. With. Yeah. Sorry, to throw in all those terms. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so it must be wonderful now that the show's kind of wrapped up and done that you guys get to tour and spend quality time together. It is. There is a little bit of that weird moment of everyone has their own career, everyone has their own path, everyone is doing their own thing right now in life, and it's a little, it's a little awkward at times when you see other people doing other things. You kind of start comparing and you start wondering if. It, if you're up to their par, or their level, or you know, mm -hmm. am I making as much money as them? Am I getting as much bookings? Am I um, doing as much with my career as I want to? And I have to remind myself, you know, it's just me. I have to focus on my career, right. and that's why I'm, I'm really spending more time on not the RuPaul's Drag Race world life, but the Blair St. Clair career. Like, what mm. is Blair doing? What does Blair want to do? Well, it's certainly you know, it's like, uh, and Mark, you can speak to this with being on a reality TV show with other contestants. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, once the show's done. It's it the real race starts. I I've said that so many times, especially mm -hmm. with RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah. I thought the race was on television, mm -hmm. but the race actually started the day we got home from filming. Because mm -hmm. you know now Blair is a business, and I have to look at it subjectively, and also I have to look at it as a whole and and as a group. And you know it makes me money. It pays my bills. It is I have my own store. You know I have my own. Um, schedule into it mm -hmm. like there's so much that goes into it and I do a lot for myself too I do all my own hair I do you know of course my own makeup and I do like a lot of costuming and I work with people and I have to remember that's my own vision at the end of the day mm. there was a, a rumor that was uh, spread on the internet um, and the reason I'm asking is because you know certainly like uh, the Trump administration has been very damaging to LGBT mm -hmm. people this uh, year and, and certainly putting our democracy up for sale um, one of the drag queens uh, had confessed that she had uh, voted for Trump. 
Who? I don't know. And, uh, and so, so someone they they rumored that they boiled it down to you or Eureka, and Eureka said that she hadn't. No, um, I hadn't. Uh. Uh-uh. And I and then I voted in Indiana. Like that's where I was registered yeah. to vote. And it's I okay if you tell you that I didn't have vote for voted Trump. for Trump. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think th- what we need to start talking about is the consequence of having Trump as president and how do we get out of the situation that we're in. Right, right. Uh, I do know quite a few people that did vote for Trump mm-hmm. that are now a what little remorseful. What can we remorseful. say to them? What can we, what, what can we talk well, to Well, first and foremost, we can't, we can't place, it's hard to say, we can't place blame because mm-hmm. what's done is done. Yeah. What's there is there, and what's ha- happened has happened. But what we can do is we can plan for the future for the same things not to happen. Mm-hmm. So you can tell people, like, get your shit together, figure out what's going on, and think about, you know, not just you, because you're not the only person who lives in this world. You know, mm-hmm. I, I hate to tell you this, but, like, you're not the only person in the world, you know, s- surrounded by, neither are you and neither am I. And we have to remember that this world works mm-hmm. by, it, it revolves around everybody, and it revolves around love, inevitably. So if we're, you know, just being hateful all the time, we're not going to get anywhere. And so, you know, some people say it's like a lot of these Trump supporters can't be, they're not living in the world of facts and knowledge and Mm -hmm. reason. And, you know, Trump changes what he says on an hourly basis. And they, they're not even, you know, Trump contradicts himself every second of the day. And so it's really hard to have a conversation with um, this cult Mm -hmm. because of the fact that they're just not here and and they're not even worth saving they're in the minority and and we need to just encourage people to vote uh, this election because our lives depend on it. Mm-hmm. I think what's also important too is you, if you want a minority to win, mm-hmm. you can't convince the mass majority that the minority is angry. We're not we're not the minority yeah. though. No, 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 I LG, agree. Yeah. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Amer- the majority of Americans support uh, mm-hmm. all, you know the Democratic Party's platform of uh, uh, socialized medicine, uh, access to uh, education, um, um, blanking out here, um, you know, decriminalizing marijuana, and um, and you know, keep getting kids out of cages. And- yeah, no, sure, I agree, but um, mm-hmm. I, I do think as well, like. And LGBT rights, oh, LGBT, yeah, and, abortion, and that that's it's mm-hmm. it's very important just to stand your firm ground on and, that. And how, how do you talk to your family about these? Because uh, you're traveling around the world, you're meeting mm-hmm. all kinds of people. Your heart and your mind is definitely growing. Mm-hmm. Um, how can you convey this information back into your? And for us, how can we sp- and, and speak to our families who don't understand this stuff? Because I'm certainly struggling with this myself. You know, mm-hmm. I have family members who are Puerto Rican, mm-hmm. and they moved to Texas, and all of a sudden they're Trump supporters. And I'm just like, and at a certain point, I'm, uh, you know, I know that their their madness is stemming from the fact that they're isolated, they're lonely, they're scared, mm-hmm. and they just don't know what to do. Well, I think what what some people do as well that I'm not discrediting. I'm not I'm not crediting what Trump does by sure. any means. I sure. will first say that first and foremost. But I don't think it's What's good is some people are um, expelling all their hate into one person mm-hmm. and one man that, you know, Trump. It's a party. It's, it's a, a system. Party. It's, it's a Fox system. News. Exactly. Exactly. And it's not one person. He is who happens to be the face of it. Sure. But, like, there is a whole, you know, entity of people that are, f- you know, full of hate and rage and that don't like that we exist and that we're doing mm-hmm. this right now. And that is the problem. The problem isn't just the one person. Now, the one person should be, you know, held accountable for. And that's sure. what we should, you know, go after. I agree. But, like, I think it, what's important, and, you know, as you asked, you know, to sell it back to parents and everything, is to, you know, and a lot of people say educate. Educate your parents. and Tell them what's going on. I'm sorry, but my parents are already educated. My parents have their full realized ideas, but my parents are open to hearing something from me if it comes from my heart. They're open to knowing more about my life. They're not going to want to be educated. But they do want to have an open conversation with me. And that open conversation is important to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to shy away from that because they're my parents. I'm not going to tell them, you know, luckily my parents, my parents specifically, you know, they love support me and they understand. They've gone through that journey with me. My parents are very conservative people that have become very liberal throughout my journey and they've Mm. seen, you know, my growth as a human being and they've understood that what I've done and what society has done and what the government, you know, has around me, everything that I am and that I represent is not anything against their beliefs or mm-hmm. their, their goodwill. And sure. so, so, so they've, they've allowed so that's themselves a real to gift. open up. Uh, I mean, you being sort of sexual and gender nonconforming has been a, a gift to them. It, it from has. From the universe. Yes. From and, God. 
it ha- and, and I will say TV too, um, I, I'm beyond thankful to every day, yeah. has helped open my parents' eyes even more seeing what I do, you know, mm-hmm. what, what I stand for, what I believe in. And, you know, not everyone can be on TV. Mm-hmm. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone can sit down and have the conversation mm-hmm. with their parents. But what I do urge people to do is to continue to be vocal and be open, but you have to remain open to that, you know, counter-criticism, that counter-argument, because if you're just too closed off to it, which I'm not saying that people mm-hmm. are, but I'm saying that some are. You know, you have to re- keep that openness to have that open conversation. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think that's important, too. I think a lot of people just sta- stand and they attack and they have this firm wall up. But they're not willing to receive anything. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with anything. And I'm not saying that anything has to be um, heard mm-hmm. and accepted. But you still have to kind of have that conversation. What's the biggest sacrifice you feel like you've had to make so far with you and your boyfriend. You were telling me that it's really hard for you guys to go out for dinner. <laughs> that, that is, that, 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 that's my choice. That's yeah. my choice because there are many late nights. So we are ordering and, you know, at two in the morning, sure. mm-hmm. uh, I, I biggest, uh, something that I've, I've given up, I think is, um, being on grinder and scruff. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. I will tell you right now. I, I think that, the way I'd have to look at it uh, is that I haven't given up anything. If anything, I've gained more with him. Mm, sure. I, I mean, sure, there are, there are moments they're like, okay. I'm, I'm talking about just all the changes that have happened, not yeah, just yeah, the relationship. Yeah. Um, I think... Because you're dealing with meet and greets, and I imagine yeah, so that's you're kind p- of in a customer service mm-hmm. job again, right? That, <laughs> you're that's a probably hairstylist the change. before, mm-hmm. and when somebody didn't like your haircut, you're sort of like slowly talking them off. The anger ledge. Right. And I imagine that when you meet some fans, they're putting on you a lot of their anger and frustration in their lives, sure. wanting to pick a fight with you. Yeah, I, I think the main term I use often is that a lot of people are trying to provoke me. They're, oh. they're trying to gain that, um, that level of interaction sure. where if they can receive a reaction from me, it's because they are trying to provoke to begin with. And so, you know, my a big change in my relationship has been we don't let anything affect our relationship, any words, you know, but we, we, like, we hear each other. We, we, are, we communicate what's, what's said, what's brought into this relationship, but we don't allow other people to bring things into our relationship because it is ours. And that's been a change of, of my, our mindset of how to look at that. Mm. I've been in, in uh, situations when I've observed meet and greets with drag queens. The drag queen that the fans came out to see is standing right there. Mm. Mm-hmm. But the fan is like, I've been waiting for two hours for this thing, and I didn't get the poster that was signed, and I was promised this, that. And I'm like, but the person you're here to meet is standing right there, mm-hmm. and you're you're not living in the present. Well, there becomes this this, this place you're, of entitlement. Sure. And, you know, I, I do what I do because I love to do it, and I do it for the people that come to support me. And, you know, like, I'll be honest, like, I won't have a job unless those people are there to support me. Sure. Mm-hmm. And I'm very thankful for that, first and foremost. Mm. But no one is entitled to anything. I'm not entitled to anything. I'm not entitled to to necessarily breathe. But so that that that's that is frustrating to me when there are some people that think that they deserve something mm-hmm. because and it's promised to them. Now if you signed up and you paid the money, I will make sure it happens. I promise you, I will fulfill the job and the duty. However, you know, there, there's also a different attitude to have about that too. It's it's never, oh, I deserve this and I should have this just because. Well, no, that's not what, how life works. I'm sorry if, if you're learning this lesson for the first time. Mm. Life doesn't happen because it doesn't revolve around you. Now, we can work together, <clears> and <throat> I will be glad to give you that meet and greet. I will be glad to sign that poster for you because that's why you're there. But no one, me included, is entitled to anything. I, I work in customer service, and I, I feel in some ways like it's really given me a, a huge benefit to be able to deal with a difficult uh, audience member or mm-hmm. fan or anything. It's and one one thing I was just want to throw out there into the universe for the people who are listening to this and to you is like when a when a angry fan comes at you, uh, sometimes just letting them talk mm-hmm. and you know giving them the opportunity to be heard and understood, even if, especially if you don't agree with them can be miraculous almost in diffusing that situation. Right, And right. so it's just that alignment with their frustration. I know you've been waiting here for so long, and I, I really just you know want to be so grateful to you for mm-hmm. for driving six hours in in you know with their headlights broken mm-hmm. in the middle of the night to come see me and 
there's round, this, you know, this round weird, rock. weird thing that I have um, yeah. been told that the, there's a name for, it, and it's called Sonder. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that everyone has their own life. So if you walk into a restaurant, every single person in that restaurant has their own life that they live. We don't know anything about their lives. So someone could come to a show that I'm in that has driven, like you said, six hours. Someone could have just decided they were going to come last minute, and they jumped into the meet and greet line. They saw something like, I don't know what, how other people live their lives as other people don't know how I live my life or each other live their life. The best way people see that I live my life is based on media or unless they meet me in person. So everyone has their own routine, their own life, their own thing that they're going through and they're going on. And it's a little unfair for some people to just expect that expectation that people know what's going on. But it is also important for me in return to always um, just be open. You know, like you said, it's just to hear, okay, I'm going to take that moment to hear that angry fan. I don't have to agree with you. And today in my life, I don't have to put up with bullshit. I don't have to take that onto my life. So you go, security. I can hear it. I can hear it. And I can, and I can just say, okay, thank you. I'm glad you have that opinion about me. Thank you for coming up next. <laughs> Blair, what was it like, uh, the process of making your album? Oh, my goodness. So that, that was a process, I will mm -hmm. tell you that. So we sat down. And for me, music has been a venue for me to just kind of express myself as, you know, a cliche as that might sound, is it's just been, every track on the album has been written specifically as a piece of my life, as a piece of my growth, as a piece mm -hmm. of me. And we dissected each song and said, okay, let's talk about different points of this past year especially. Different points that make Blair St. Clair, that make Drew, Drew, that make this whole entity that I am me, and I want to share that. I want to share a little bit of my voice. And we, you know, we we came up with song titles that match that. We came mm -hmm. up with lyrics that match that. We came up with melodies that kind of understood that vibe. And that all came from Now or Never. You know, we're releasing that single on my Elimination episode, and that was just for me, really. I wrote, we wrote that song. Uh, I have a songwriter who helped me co-write everything, and we wrote that as a means of release. And the whole idea behind that song is everyone has things in their life they're either unproud of, they're not proud of, they are... Um, going through whatever that is, that is everyone's own personal life um, thing, life entity. Mm -hmm. And it's about taking charge of that now or never. And that was for me. It was like, okay, I had a lot of going on in my life, specifically discuss on the show a lot of trauma. Sure. And it's my job that I've taken over these course of the past few months that I've had before it aired on television to make a better life and experience for myself. And it's now or never is the time to do that. So that was the idea behind that single was for me. And it just so happened to be received so well, everyone was able to relate so well, and that's what stemmed us writing the album. Mm -hmm. You heard the rumors that uh, Britney Spears didn't show up to this studio to, for her collaboration with Will I Am. She just recorded onto like a phone really? voicemail. Uh -uh. It's Britney, bitch. And that was how they sampled that into da na 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 You know that really? song? Really? Yeah. Dang. I mean, that'd be, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to put any ideas in your head, but. No, no, no. That'd be kind of funny. Every artist has something that works for themselves. <laughs> you call your uh, songwriter be like, <laughs> it's Blair St. Clair, bitch. Okay, make a song out of that. Bye. <laughs> I'm not so sure I like the song. I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to sing it. I'm not going to pay for it. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, spending some time with you here today. Um, you know, personally, like, I've enjoyed looking at all your looks, and your makeup you. has inspired me <laughs> as a drag queen. And, you know, I'm using, like, paint my numbers by looking at your face. It's uh, Paint by Blair. <laughs> paint by Blair. Paint by Blair. <laughs> if you, girls, if you Put want to know. the pink here, the yeah. glitter there. A little, all you need is a little pink, a little shimmer. And a little lash, and you're good to go. Gloss on the lips. I, I do love the simplicity of what you're doing, but at the same time, how your makeup is very good at sort of, uh, for my, you know, horrifyingly <laughs> masculine face, uh, distracting from that. You know, the, the, the aggressive rouge that you're using. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great technique, thank and you, I really thank, thank you. you for putting that, that out there. That's always evolving, you know, like my career, yeah. like my personality, like who I am. And I, I think I, I was actually a little frustrated. I asked uh, Miss Fam of all, all people, I said, you know, is it, is it frustrating looking back at those pictures when you started um, doing drag or started, you know, day one on Drag Race or whatever, and you've seen your makeup evolve? And she said, no, that's the beauty in it. Mm. And I said, Oh, okay, because today I lack 
perception and like I, I, I lack, you know, like how I am able to look at things and um, she gave you a paper bag and she, said, put this on. She, 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 she was like, she's like, you're, you know, like you, you might not be fame and I'm, I'm not fame by any means, but I, I was able to kind of look at my makeup a little bit differently and not be so upset by seeing some of the old well, things. Well, it's great to watch a yeah. lot of these girls because, you know, they have so much talent and they go on Drag Race and they look good, mm -hmm. but then they learn so much there and they so learn much. so much afterwards because they're constant. Now they have a full time career. So it's every night putting on the makeup and, mm -hmm. you know, practice makes perfect. Absolutely. And, you know, I had never been around queens from all over the, mm -hmm. over the country before until mm -hmm. Drag Race and then you know, learning from the best of the best in the business who've been in it for the longest mm -hmm. amount of time. Yeah. So that's what really did teach me a lot. Mm -hmm. What kind of food uh, do you enjoy eating? Uh, everything. What's your, like, you know, go-to comfort food? Uh, Chinese food. Carry out mm. Chinese food at 3 in the morning. You love, uh, after fan every of egg show. Rolls. Oh, it, it, Lots of duck sauce on it. Everything. <laughs> if it's an egg roll, if it is a dumpling, if it is general, everything. Everything. Well, we have to uh, stir fry with you sometime. There's actually a funny story about. Are you ready to stir fry, stir fry for your life? <laughs> oh, I, I, I can stir fry for my life. And I used to like take food home with me yeah. from set of Drag Race back to my hotel room. Everyone would be like laugh at me. They'd be like, "What is that skinny little bitch doing with all the food filled in her backpack, going to back her to her hotel room?" And I would eat everything that night. I would just like take a bunch of snacks with me, take a bunch of drinks with me. I'd go back to my hotel room at the end of the night, and I'd. Um, because you're forced to be there by yourself. Alone, yeah, right? yeah. You don't have anything to do, mm -hmm. and I so would just. I'm, I'm, I'm pounding the uh, the the headphone mixer because the, the sound cuts off it goes in, the, in, and out. in the middle. <laughs> Sorry, folks. This is a reminder that Feast of Fun is made possible because of your generous financial support. <laughs> uh, come put a tip in our tip jar. Go to feastoffun.com/slash/donate and make a donation to our show. Come on, promotion. The, yeah, and the best way to support the podcast is to become a member, and you can do that at Feast of Fun. Dot com slash plus because your contribution to the show is what makes this show happen. We wouldn't be able to talk to fabulous people like Blair St. Clair oh, me. if it weren't for you. We have 14 <laughs> years of in-depth interviews with lots of RuPaul's Drag Race girls, <laughs> lots of the judges, and RuPaul herself. Oh. And the very start of Drag Race, hoping the show would... I'm just hoping the show I can be as good as the show is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a quote from Showgirls, but yeah, RuPaul actually was very, uh, had a lot of doubts. Really? In okay. the early uh, first year of Drag Race, that mm -hmm. it would catch on. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a very hard sell to Logo. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, Logo had flatly refused uh, many times to do any content about drag queens. Mm -hmm. And they felt that there was not much future. Uh, when it came to drag. Boy, so. were they wrong. Uh, well, yes. But then they were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, MTV, uh, or VH1, snatched it away from me. Like, Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that. Thanks for the hard work. I'll take that credit. Uh -huh. It is uh, uh -huh. one of their top shows. Yeah, it actually, um, I think... Viacom it, is, uh, it'd be like, please don't go anywhere. Drag Race was actually rated, the first week that our season premiered, was the most watched television show in the country. I at that know. point in time. And I was like... Wow! Really? Yeah, it was. It was just like a one time. It rating. was uh, next to sporting events. Mm -hmm. It was uh, one of the top rated premieres on, on television. VH1 or on television. television? Oh wow! Yeah, cable and broadcast. I, when I heard Girl, that, I was dust like, "Wow!" Off that wig. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I too dream of being on Drag Race audience. <laughs> well, uh, Blair, let's let's leave uh, the audience with uh, one of your songs from your new album. Wait, wait! Before you oh. do that, what you have a, a dream. You have oh, a, oh. Uh, you want to throw a dream out into the universe. You sure. want to meet Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato. I do. I Demi is such a huge inspiration to me. We talk about, you know, like power divas that are really, really climbing and rising kind of right now in society, especially, you know, in her youth. And I just think she is so incredible. She has so much to say. She is such a powerhouse, not only in her voice, but also in her demeanor and everything she stands for and her morals. Mm -hmm. And I just... Absolutely, am enthralled with Demi Lovato. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what do you want to do with Demi Lovato? Go out for tea and crumpets? Girl, we, we can go out for tea and crumpets. She can call me. We can sing together. We can kiki. She can come in one of my shows. I'll go to her concert. I'll go on tour with her. Demi, if you're watching, I'll do whatever you want to do. I'll uh, post this clip on Twitter and I'll tag her with it. <laughs> And and hopefully you know I'm some hopefully somebody we can make this happen. Mm. Let's yeah. make this dream come true. Let's make it happen. Uh, Blair St. Clair. I love you so much. You're so sweet Thank and so you. kind and so generous. Uh, I really appreciate your spirit that you brought to season 10 of Drag Race. Thank you. A hundred, over a hundred drag queens now, right? Yeah, I think we are at 140. 
Shit. At this rate, everyone's going to be on Drag Race wow. soon enough, so don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> never. You should never stop trying. Seriously, yeah. I mean, it's, it's someone's time now or never. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's now or never. It's now or never. <laughs> <laughs> Available on iTunes <laughs> today. Ding. Uh, you're going to leave us with a song uh, from the. Actually, this is the uh, title song. Yes. from the album. This is the title song from the album um, called Call My Life. Call and me. it's about my entire journey about into my life. The whole album is describing and uh, everything about me and my personal and spiritual growth. And I'm excited to share a little bit of that with the world. $4.99 mm. uh, the first minute, uh, $1.99 each additional <laughs> minute. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, really great to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on Thank the show. You guys. And hopefully uh, mm. someday we can cook together. Absolutely. Mm. I'll ah. eat everything. Really? <laughs> yum, yum. Anything? <laughs> well, you have to pay me for anything. <laughs> Bye, Thank everybody. You, Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.